we would like to send out a special thanks to Best Fiends for supporting the Trailwind Cold. And Best Fiends puzzles are getting into the Halloween spirit. Don't miss the spooky levels, outfits, and challenges Best Fiends puts on during October. Download free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Thank you, and enjoy the episode. March 5th, 1957. El Paso, Texas. 52-year-old William Pat Patterson and his 42-year-old wife, Margaret Patterson, vanish without explanation from their home, leaving everything behind. Ten days later, Pat's accountant receives a telegram from him, stating that he and Margaret are on an extended vacation and providing instructions about how to handle their assets and business. However, there is speculation that Pat did not actually write the telegram, and even though evidence eventually emerges to suggest that the Pattersons were victims of foul play, no trace of the couple is ever found. After that, the trail went cold. Hello everyone and welcome to another Halloween themed episode of The Trail Went Cold. I'm your host Robin Warder, and today we're going to be covering a missing persons case involving a married couple, the 1957 disappearances of William and Margaret Patterson. As you probably know, every October, it's become a tradition for The Trail Went Cold to count down to Halloween by releasing episodes about creepy mysteries which have some sort of Halloween slant to them. Well, the reason I selected this particular story is because it has achieved some notoriety in El Paso, Texas, because the house where the Pattersons once lived is believed to be haunted. Over the past several decades, there have been rumors of strange noises and occurrences taking place at that house, which has fueled speculation that the missing couple's remains might still be on the property somewhere. But if that's all there was to this story, I wouldn't be covering it. The fact of the matter is that the supernatural elements are just the tip of the iceberg in what is one heck of a bizarre and convoluted mystery. The story of William and Margaret Patterson is unique, and that the couple vanished without explanation from their home and left everything behind, but no one actually reported them missing to the police for five months. This is due largely to the receipt of a telegram in which Mr. Patterson informed his accountant that both he and his wife were going to be away on an extended vacation, but since they've never resurfaced, many people believe that the telegram was a fake, which was actually written by the person responsible for the couple's disappearance. Indeed, evidence would eventually surface to suggest that the Pattersons were victims of foul play, but there's been a number of crazy theories surrounding this case, and we're going to explore them all on today's episode. However, before we get started, just a quick reminder that The Trail Went Cold is a weekly podcast, which is currently available for download on several platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it, and please leave us a rating or review on any of those sites to help spread the word and garner us more exposure. The Trail Went Cold is on Patreon, so if you would like to learn how to support the show, please visit our page at patreon.com slash thetrailwentcold. For as little as $1 a month, you can garner access to exclusive rewards, which may include stickers and thank you cards, early access to episodes, and bonus content. So with all that out of the way, let us now explore the mysterious disappearances of William and Margaret Patterson. Our story begins in El Paso, Texas in 1957. Our central figures are 52-year-old William Darrell Patterson, who goes by the nickname Pat, and his 42-year-old wife, Margaret Patterson. The couple have been married for nearly 24 years and originally moved to El Paso sometime during the early 1940s. They now live together in a house on Piedmont Drive and own a photography supply store in the downtown area called Patterson Photo Supply. On the afternoon of March the 5th, Pat and Margaret visited a garage called the Ward Motor Clinic in order to ask the owner, Cecil Ward, to help them shop for an air conditioner for a mobile home they owned. Ward was Pat's closest friend, so he assisted the couple with the request, and after helping deliver the air conditioner to their house, he returned to his garage at around 4.30 p.m. Ward was scheduled to return to the Patterson residence that evening in order to help Pat work on his boat, but due to a leg ailment, he was forced to visit a doctor and receive a shot for treatment. He called Pat up and informed him he would have to cancel, to which Pat replied, quote, That's okay, Kirk and I will do the best we can. Kirk just happened to be the nickname for another friend of Pat's named D.G. Kirkland, who lived nearly 350 miles away in Lubbock and managed a chain of processing plants for a rival business called Duffy's Photo Supply. He was visiting El Paso at this time, and on the evening of March the 4th, Kirkland, Ward, and Ward's wife were invited to the Patterson residence for dinner, and the two men would also help Pat work on his boat. But at 8 a.m. on the morning of March the 6th, things would take a bizarre turn when Ward arrived at his garage and discovered that the Patterson's Cadillac was parked there. He was soon visited by Kirkland, who claimed he had also canceled the previous night's engagement at the Patterson residence, but wound up receiving an unexpected phone call in his motel room at around 3 a.m. According to Kirkland, Pat informed him that he and Margaret were going to have to leave town for a while to deal with some alcohol-related issues. After finding a photo of another woman in Pat's wallet, Margaret had supposedly reacted by going on a drinking binge, so Pat said they were going away to seek treatment for her, 
and he wanted Kirkland to help run his photo supply business while they were gone. He told Kirkland he was leaving his Cadillac at the Ward Motor Clinic for repairs, and that he could find the keys to his residence and his store inside the glove compartment. Well, Ward was left surprised by Kirkland's story, but he had no reason to doubt it, so after Kirkland took the keys from the glove compartment, Ward agreed to perform the requested repairs on the Cadillac. However, there was an odd discrepancy. At around 7.15 a.m. that same morning, one of Ward's mechanics, Nicholas Alvarez, arrived at the garage to open for business and saw what he described as a man with a dark complexion with the Cadillac. According to Alvarez, the man was definitely not William Patterson or D.G. Kirkland, and he left after climbing into a Chevrolet, being driven by another unidentified individual. After visiting Ward Motor Clinic, Kirkland went to Patterson Photo Supply in order to open the store for business. He was soon joined by a 24-year-old employee named Art Marino, who was pretty much being trained as Pat's apprentice. Kirkland informed Marino he would be running the business during the Patterson's absence, and that if any customers asked about them, the employees were instructed to say they had left on an extended vacation. Over the course of the next week, no one heard from the Pattersons, but on March the 15th, their accountant, Herbert Roth, received a telegram which seemed to have been written by Pat, who informed him that both he and Margaret were going away for an extended period of time, and provided instructions about how to handle their assets and business. Pat told Roth to rent out their house for the next nine months, and sell off their mobile home in order to use the proceeds to fund Patterson Photo Supply. He also wanted to lure Kirkland away from Duffy's Photo Supply at a competitive salary, so he could continue managing the store in their absence. Pat and Margaret had been planning to travel to Washington, D.C. in April in order to attend a National Photographers Association convention, but Pat told Roth to ask Art Marino to cancel their hotel reservations. Curiously, the bottom of the telegram stated that it had been sent by W.H. Patterson, even though his middle name was Durrell. It would turn out that the original request to send the telegram had been made from a phone at a pay station near Love Field Airport in Dallas, so it could not be conclusively established that Pat himself sent it. In spite of this, Roth showed the telegram to Kirkland and Marino and while they were surprised by Pat's instructions, they agreed to fulfill his wishes. Within the next few months, arrangements were made to rent out the Patterson residence, and a janitorial service run by a man named D.G. Prince was hired to clean it. However, according to Prince, the house was left in complete disarray, as there were unwashed dishes in the sink, rotten food in the refrigerator, and clothing was lying out on the bed. Even though Pat had written he would be gone for an extended period of time, he did not make any arrangements to disconnect the utilities or end their newspaper delivery. No attempt was made to stop mail delivery to the house for a month and a half, until the post office received instructions to reroute all mail to Patterson Photo Supply. Prior to his disappearance, Pat had taken some of his clothes to the cleaners, but he never picked them up, and Margaret did the same thing when she left one of her fur coats with a furrier. In addition, Pat originally procured his boat from a couple in Wisconsin, but never finished paying them for it before he took off. The only thing which appeared to be missing was Margaret's cat, Tommy, who would normally be boarded at a local animal hospital whenever the couple traveled. Well, when new tenants moved into the Patterson residence, Tommy suddenly showed up there, looking malnourished and filthy. He had presumably been wandering through the area, and since Margaret was described as loving Tommy as if he were her own child, this raised some major red flags. It was not until August the 15th, five months after the Pattersons were last seen, when Cecil Ward contacted the El Paso County Sheriff's Department and officially filed a missing persons report for them. According to Ward, when he visited the Patterson residence on the evening of March the 4th and helped Pat work on his boat, Pat never mentioned anything about leaving on an extended vacation. In fact, Pat had even discussed his plans for later that week, as well as fishing trips he was hoping to take in the upcoming months. Ward's wife corroborated his story, claiming that Margaret never told her she was leaving, and that everything seemed perfectly normal. However, investigators did learn that Pat had a history of cheating on his wife with other women, and the situation had caused Margaret to develop a drinking problem. Prior to his disappearance, Pat had been conducting an affair with 20-year-old Estefano Arroyo Marfan, who lived in Juarez, Mexico. One month before he went missing, Pat traveled to Juarez to visit the nightclub where Estefana worked, and he got heavily intoxicated. When Pat ordered a drink for Estefana, the waiter refused to serve her because she was an employee, so Pat became belligerent, and the situation escalated into a fight in which he was beaten up by the club's bouncers. When she was first interviewed by police, Estefana claimed that she received a letter from Pat on April the 6th, one month after he was last seen, where he wrote that he had some important things to tell her, and stated, quote, When they come for me, I'll have to go in a hurry. While Estefana would later recant this story, and when asked to take a lie detector test, the results seemed to indicate that she was telling the truth when she said she never heard from Pat. Investigators started delving into the background of the missing couple, and learned that Pat originally hailed from Chicago, and had spent the early part of his life traveling throughout the country, working as a carnival barker, before he settled in El Paso. Pat's father and four sisters were still alive, but curiously, none of the Patterson's friends or acquaintances seemed to know anything about Margaret's family or her background. The investigation would learn that Margaret originally hailed from Kentucky and had been raised on a farm near the town of Owensboro before she left home at a young age. She eventually met Pat, but since her family did not approve of him, Margaret completely cut herself off from them after they got married. 
Even though Margaret had six siblings, none of them had actually seen or heard from her for nearly 20 years and assumed she was dead. The most concerning thing about the Patterson's disappearance was that their bank accounts were never touched after they left. A court of inquiry would be scheduled for June of 1958, but on May the 29th, only a few days before it was set to begin, the couple's lawyer received a letter which was postmarked from Laredo, Texas, and appeared to have been written by Pat. Once again, he provided instructions about how to dispose of his property and business, writing, quote, We will not be back to El Paso, and by the time you get this, we will be out of the country, and nobody can find us, end quote. Pat wanted a one-quarter share of his photo supply business to be divided among Herbert Roth, Art Marino, and a photo supply salesman friend of his from Albuquerque, New Mexico, named Doyle Riley. The remaining quarter share would then be divided up among Pat's other employees. As far as property, Riley would receive the Patterson's vacation cabin, tools, boat, and Cadillac, while Marino would get their house and furniture. The letter also provided instructions to send monthly $100 payments to Pat's elderly father, Luther Patterson, who was currently living in Missouri. While the letter itself was typewritten, there was a handwritten signature at the bottom, and unlike the telegram from the previous year, it had the correct middle initial, W.D. Patterson. While experts compared the signature on the letter with known samples of Pat's handwriting, and while there were a number of similarities, there were also enough discrepancies to prevent them from conclusively saying that the W.D. Patterson signature originated from Pat. But it turned out the letter had no legal value anyway, since no one had actually witnessed Pat sign it, and since Margaret was technically a co-owner of Patterson Photo Supply, her signature would also be required for the instructions in the letter to be valid. In spite of the suspicions about the letter, Pat's family was not overly concerned about his disappearance and figured he would eventually resurface. In fact, one of Pat's sisters, Mildred Patterson Boris, refused to travel to El Paso for the court of inquiry, stating, quote, We'll just wait and let them come back when they want to. Pat's father, Luther, did agree to travel there to testify, but hinted that because of his son's previous experience working with the carnival, it was not uncommon for him to move around a lot. Luther stated, quote, I always knew Pat and Margaret would take off like this someday, but I figured it would be four or five years away. They're not dead. My boy has done things like this before. He made his living doing sleight of hand tricks, end quote. D.G. Kirkland testified at the court of inquiry and recounted his story about receiving the 3 a.m. phone call from Pat prior to his disappearance, but this time, Kirkland acknowledged that because he was so sleepy when he received the call, he could not be 100% certain if the voice on the line was actually Pat. After managing Patterson Photo Supply for a few months, Kirkland decided to buy controlling interest in his previous employer, Duffy's Photo Supply. He subsequently returned to Lubbock, though he would still make trips back to El Paso to check in on the Patterson business. When the court appointed Herbert Roth to the position of receiver for Patterson Photo Supply in early 1958, Kirkland resigned from the company. The original owner of Duffy's Photo Supply was a friend of Pat's named Duffy Sasser, and during the early stages of the investigation, Sasser told police that he had received a series of phone calls from Pat in Florida after the couple went missing, where Pat informed him that he was taking Margaret to help her recuperate from a nervous condition. However, by the time he testified at the court of inquiry, Sasser completely recanted his story. He claimed that he only lied because Pat had once told him that if he ever disappeared, Sasser was to act as if everything was all right because he would be returning soon. In the end, the court of inquiry failed to reach a conclusion about the circumstances of the Patterson's disappearance. By the end of the year, Art Marino was managing Patterson Photo Supply and had moved into the couple's former residence with his wife, but the business would be sold off to new management in 1962. As the years went on, there were numerous reported sightings of the Pattersons throughout the United States and Mexico, including a few witnesses who claimed to have seen them checking into a hotel in Val del Bravo, but none of them ever panned out. While Luther Patterson initially believed that the couple had taken off voluntarily, after not hearing from them for a long period of time, he finally conceded that they were probably no longer alive, so Pat and Margaret were both declared legally dead in March of 1964. However, in 1984, the case would be reopened when a witness named Reynaldo Nangari came forward. Nangari had worked as a caretaker at the Patterson residence and claimed that he was hired to clean the house shortly after they went missing. Nangari said that he found traces of blood around the water heater in the garage and discovered what appeared to be a piece of human scalp in the propeller on Pat's boat. Nangari also found a pair of jeans and a Rolex watch which belonged to Pat and said that he witnessed one of the couple's associates taking blood-stained sheets out of the house and putting them inside the trunk of a car. When asked why he waited 27 years to come forward with this information, Nangari stated that even though he was currently a legal U.S. citizen, he was an undocumented immigrant back in 1957 and feared potential legal trouble if he went to the authorities. In spite of this new information, investigators could not find any corroborating evidence to take the case to a grand jury, and Nangari would be killed in a car accident two years later. In 2005, the El Paso County Sheriff's Department and the El Paso Police Department joined forces to take a fresh look at the case. When a new article was published in the El Paso Times, El Paso County Sheriff Leo Samaniego decided to share his own theory. Quote, I think they were spies. The way they got up and just walked away and left everything behind. The Russians, or whoever sent them, probably told them to drop everything and go back. 
Some people said they had seen Patterson take photographs of Fort Bliss and of military shipments on the trains that came here, end quote. Indeed, when Pat first moved to El Paso, his first job was working as a street photographer who took pictures of everything before he eventually opened up his photo supply store. However, nothing could be found in any of the original case files to suggest that the Pattersons were ever suspected of espionage. Investigators tried to track down many of the original witnesses, but by this point, Cecil Ward and Herbert Roth were deceased. While Art Marino was still alive at this point, he had left the country on vacation when the El Paso Times article was published It was unavailable for comment. As for D.G. Kirkland, the police lost track of him after he left El Paso and his current whereabouts were unknown. In 2013, a woman named Jerry Cash, one of the Patterson's former neighbors, came forward and shared an unusual story with the El Paso Times. Cash claimed that on the evening of March 5th, the last day the couple was seen, she had stopped by the Patterson residence to offer them some boxes of her daughter's Girl Scout cookies. Cash said she was taken aback by the couple's behavior, as Pat appeared to be unhappy that she was there, while Margaret seemed upset, so she dropped off the cookies and quickly left. The Patterson's former residence on Piedmont Drive is still standing today and has become a rather infamous location in El Paso because it is believed to be haunted. Over the past several decades, there have been reports of strange noises and occurrences taking place at the house, leading to speculation that the couple's remains might still be buried on the property somewhere. However, no evidence has ever been found to support this theory, so the actual circumstances of what happened to William and Margaret Patterson remain unknown. So I guess you could say, the trail went cold. But before we continue, we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Best Fiends. Yes, it's finally October, which means costume tricksters, ghoulish beasts, and lots of candy. And of course, as you probably know, spooky Halloween-themed episodes of The Trail Went Cold. Well, here's an additional treat. Your favorite mobile puzzle game, Best Fiends, has also gotten into the Halloween spirit. And you won't want to miss the spooky levels, outfits, and challenges Best Fiends puts on all month. It's just one more way to enjoy spooky season to the fullest. We all have a good challenge, and Best Fiends gives you over 5,000 of them. More levels, events, and challenges are added all the time, which means you don't have to choose between binging and boredom. In fact, you might find yourself wondering how you ever found the time for a dull moment before. I certainly haven't had many moments of boredom since starting Best Fiends last year, and I nearly reached level 850 and hope to finally conquer it by Halloween. In fact, the game's decision to add its own Halloween-themed levels and challenges this month has only made me more motivated to play it, and I'm sure you will feel that way as well. So download Best Fiends free today from the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of our Halloween-themed episode. Now, I remember first becoming familiar with this case many years ago when I stumbled upon a website which had a write-up about it. Back then, there wasn't much information about this story available online, but most of what I did find put a heavy emphasis on the fact that the Patterson home was alleged to be haunted. In fact, I've seen some sources state that one of the theories surrounding this case involves UFO abduction, but I have no idea where that one came from. The whole haunted house angle is the main reason I decided to feature this as a Halloween-themed episode, but even though I do not believe it has much bearing on the story, I still feel it's worth discussing. Like it or not, the house where William and Margaret Patterson lived and disappeared from has become a pretty infamous landmark for those with an interest in the paranormal. I previously made mention of comments from former El Paso County Sheriff Leo Samaniego, and he claimed that back when he was working as a patrolman, he constantly responded to calls from an elderly woman who resided at the house because she often had to deal with kids who heard the place was haunted and wanted to check it out. From my searches online, I've seen a couple of paranormal researchers claim they have visited the Patterson residence and heard the sounds of a woman's voice and a scream. In fact, if you go to the website for the El Paso radio station, 93.1 KISS FM, you'll find some audio clips which were shared on one of their morning shows by a paranormal expert named Henry Flores. He claims that he recorded what sounded like some distressed cries from a woman while he was inside the Patterson home, but if you listen to the clips, they sound way too muffled to clearly make anything out. Hilariously enough, the website now has a disclaimer which reads, quote, The home is private property. Please do not trespass or bother the homeowners. In 2017, the current owner of the house was interviewed in an article about the case and maintained that he has never personally experienced any paranormal activity, though he said that people are always interested in viewing the house at Halloween, and at one point, someone used salt to leave a pentagram symbol in the driveway. Of course, these stories have only added to the legend of the Patterson disappearance and fueled rumors that the couple's spirits are haunted the spot where they were murdered and their bodies might still be there. The current owner has always denied any request to dig up the backyard, but even if the Patterson's remains are not on the actual property, people have wondered if they might have been buried somewhere on Crazy Cat Mountain, which is located right behind the backyard. While numerous searches of the mountain have failed to turn up any evidence to support this, the fact that the Pattersons were not officially reported missing for five months would have given the perpetrator ample time to cover up the crime. 
Now, thanks to the wonderful invention of newspapers.com, I've been able to research the original coverage of this case from the 1950s, and well, there's not any mention of ghosts or UFOs. What did emerge during my research was one hell of a convoluted mystery with a number of characters who would have had motive to make the Pattersons disappear. Even if you completely discount the entire angle involving the supernatural, this is still a very odd story which is worthy of exploration on this podcast. What also adds to the intrigue is the enigmatic nature of the two missing victims. On the surface, William Patterson, aka Pat, and his wife Margaret, seemed like a pretty ordinary couple who ran a successful business and were living a good life, but their backgrounds were a lot more colorful than people would have expected. Pat spent years pretty much living a transient lifestyle by touring around the country as a carnival barker, and before he settled in El Paso and started his photo supply business, Pat spent World War II selling nylon stockings he had smuggled in from Mexico on the black market, which is a pretty unusual way to make a living. The couple's relationships with their own respective families also seemed to be a bit odd, as Margaret broke off all contact with them for two decades when she married Pat. And when Pat disappeared, his own family did not seem particularly concerned, and seemed to hold the attitude that this was just something he did, and that he would turn up eventually. Given the circumstances, I can almost see how this odd theory about the Pattersons being spies came about, but we'll talk more about that in a little while. And another theory which came up that I'll eventually be exploring is that Pat could have killed Margaret and taken off on his own. But first, let's talk about the circumstances of how the Pattersons went missing. They left their house in complete disarray, and it sounds like virtually all of their personal items, including their Cadillac, were left behind, which is why it was hard to imagine them taking off voluntarily. In fact, I'm not sure people would have put any stock into that theory at all if two separate letters supposedly written by Pat hadn't shown up over the next year. The story provided in the initial telegram sent to Herbert Roth ten days after the couple's disappearance is that Pat and Margaret were going to be on extended vacation for several months, which is why Pat provided Roth with instructions for how to handle his business affairs. But of course the problem is that since this telegram was sent by someone who phoned in instructions to a Western Union office in Dallas, there is no concrete proof that Pat actually sent it. Since this was 1957, there were far fewer restrictions on this sort of thing, so theoretically, anyone could have traveled to Dallas and sent the telegram in Pat's name. Indeed, it looks suspicious that the telegram was signed W.H. Patterson when Pat's middle initial was D, but to be fair, it sounds like this telegram was transcribed from the person who originally sent it, so it's possible an employee from Western Union could have made this mistake. Now, if this telegram was a fake, I'll state right up front that the first person who seems like a natural suspect is D.G. Kirkland. As you recall, Kirkland claimed that during the early morning hours of March the 6th, he received a phone call at his motel from Pat, who told him that he and Margaret were taking off for a while, and asked Kirkland to run his business and get repairs done on his Cadillac while they were gone. Now, Kirkland lived in Lubbock and helped manage a rival business called Duffy's Photo Supply, but it's very interesting how he wound up purchasing controlling interest in Duffy's later that year. Admittedly, I don't know anything about Kirkland's personal finances, but per the instructions in the telegram, Herbert Roth later put up the Patterson residence for rent and sold off their mobile home in order to help fund Patterson Photo Supply. Theoretically, if this helped give Kirkland the necessary funds to buy controlling interest in Duffy's, this gives him a potential motive. Here is the biggest issue with Kirkland's story about the phone call. He claims that Pat told him he would be dropping off his Cadillac at Ward Motor Clinic for repairs and leave the keys to his residence and his business in the glove compartment. But the big complication is the eyewitness testimony of the mechanic, Nicholas Alvarez, who said he saw another man who was not William Patterson drop off the Cadillac at the shop that morning about 45 minutes before Kirkland arrived. This man was picked up by an unidentified person driving a Chevrolet, so this begs the question, who were these people, and how did they fit into the whole thing? If Kirkland was telling the truth about the phone call, why would Pat have someone else drop off the Cadillac for him? What were the Pattersons using for transportation to leave town? Why wouldn't this person have come forward after the couple's disappearance became a big news story? If Kirkland was lying, then it's easy to assume that he was complicit in what happened, and this mysterious man with the Cadillac was involved. He could have hired someone to murder the Pattersons, get rid of the bodies, and drop off the car in order to give himself an alibi. I guess the third possibility is that the phone call did happen, but someone else was impersonating Pat, and Kirkland was telling the truth when he testified that he was too sleepy to realize what was going on. According to Cecil Ward, both he and Kirkland were scheduled to visit the Patterson residence on the evening of March the 5th to help Pat work on his boat, but Ward was forced to cancel because of a leg injury. During his final conversation with Ward, Pat implied that Kirkland would still be coming over, but Kirkland later said that he had to cancel as well, and there's no way to really prove or disprove that. However, what's also interesting is that Kirkland's boss, Duffy Sasser, the owner of Duffy's photo supply, was also caught lying. Sasser initially claimed that Pat phoned him numerous times after he disappeared to confirm that he and Margaret were taking off for a while, but then he said these calls never happened and that he made the whole story up. I mean, even though it sounds like Pat was friends with Kirkland and Sasser, they were technically rivals in the photo supply business, so would these guys have had motive to get Pat out of the way? Otherwise, I'm not sure why Sasser would have felt the need to lie about something like this. 
But before I start accusing both these men, I do have to acknowledge that Dallas, the location where the telegram originated from, is nearly 350 miles away from their hometown of Lubbock, and over 650 miles from El Paso. So if the telegram was a fake, and did not actually originate from Pat, the responsible party traveled a great distance in order to send it. But of course the real wild card in this case is the letter which Pat's lawyer received in May of 1958. Unlike the telegram, this actually had a signature from W.D. Patterson, though it cannot be conclusively determined if the handwriting belonged to Pat. The letter requested that Patterson Photo Supply be divided up among Herbert Roth, Art Marino, Doyle Riley, and the rest of the employees. There are a couple of sources out there which mistakenly say that Doyle Riley's share was supposed to go to D.G. Kirkland, but you can find a photo of the original letter in the newspaper archives, and it definitely says Doyle Riley. I think there's been some confusion over this fact, because some sources state that Kirkland's first name was Doyle, but multiple newspaper articles confirm that the D in his initials actually stood for David. But the distinction between Doyle Riley and D.G. Kirkland is very important. While Kirkland benefited from the instructions provided in Pat's original telegram, he did not actually benefit from the instructions in this letter. So if the letter was a forgery, what motive would Kirkland have had to write it? The instructions about Pat's father receiving monthly payments of $100 does seem like one of those authentic details which suggests that Pat himself wrote the letter, but I cannot ignore the timing of it arriving only days before the start of the Court of Inquiry. Someone may have had a vested interest in giving off the false impression that Pat was still alive. Now, since Margaret's signature was not on the letter, none of the instructions provided had any legal value, but Doyle Riley was someone who would have benefited since he was supposed to receive the Patterson's vacation cabin, boat, and Cadillac. There isn't much information out there about Riley, aside from the fact that he was a friend of Pat's who lived in Albuquerque, but I've never seen anything to suggest he might be involved. Even though he was set to receive Pat's house, I've never been all that suspicious of Art Marino. By all accounts, he was Pat's apprentice and was being trained to take over his business someday, but it sounds like Marino was just as surprised as everyone else when Kirkland suddenly showed up and started running the store because the Pattersons had supposedly taken off. In an interview with the El Paso Times in 1984, Marino said he did believe that the Pattersons left voluntarily because of Margaret's drinking problem. According to Marino, she had surgery shortly before her disappearance and was under doctor's orders not to drink during a recovery, but he suspected that if Margaret had fallen off the wagon, Pat would have taken her somewhere to help deal with the issue in secrecy. However, during his interview, Marino acknowledged that the police's theories about foul play sounded plausible, so he welcomed a new investigation into the case. Now, Herbert Roth was the one who received Pat's original telegram, and he wound up benefiting from his disappearance in the long run when he was named receiver of Patterson Photo Supply. And if you read the original newspaper coverage of this case, Roth does come across as rather nonchalant in his interviews, as he seemed to believe the Pattersons had just taken off for a while and would eventually return. But would he really have been willing to go so far as to be complicit in a murder conspiracy? Of course, the big development in this case which pointed towards foul play occurred when Reynaldo Nangari came forward in 1984 and claimed he had been hired to clean the Patterson residence following their disappearance, where he found traces of blood and a piece of scalp, and also saw one of Pat's quote-unquote associates putting bloody bedsheets into a trunk. They've never publicly released this associate's name, they've never publicly released this person's name, but the problem is that there are a lot of associates in this story. Whoever it was, it doesn't sound like the authorities considered Nangari's account to be strong enough evidence to arrest this person. Now, it's been reported that when the house was put up for rent, a janitorial service owned by a man named D.G. Prince was hired to clean it up, but this was months after the Pattersons disappeared. It sounds like the cleanup which Nangari participated in took place much earlier, and was likely done to get rid of any potential evidence which suggested foul play, such as blood. If the Pattersons were murdered inside the house, it might seem weird that the perpetrator would run the risk of hiring someone to clean up their mess, and be brazen enough to remove bloody sheets from the residence while Nangari was there. But by his own admission, Nangari was an illegal immigrant at the time, which is why he did not come forward for 27 years, so perhaps the perpetrator knew this and decided to take advantage of the situation. Now, it's unclear when exactly Nangari was hired to do this, but it's worth mentioning that D.G. Kirkland was the one who immediately had the keys to the Patterson residence in his possession, since he took them from the Cadillac's glove compartment the morning after they disappeared. It's also worth mentioning that two days later, on March the 8th, Cecil Ward phoned up Patterson Photo Supply because Pat had recently borrowed his sander to work on his boat, and Ward told one of the employees that he needed it back. Well, later that same day, Kirkland showed up at Ward's garage to give him the sander, so he obviously had access to the house, and would have had ample opportunity to get rid of any evidence if a crime took place there. I also find it interesting that a piece of scalp was supposedly found on the boat propeller, which might suggest that Pat was attacked while working on the boat. And while Kirkland always denied that he visited the residence on the evening of March the 5th, Pat's original plan for them was to work on the boat together. Overall, I do think the most logical explanation is that both Pat and Margaret were murdered inside the house before their bodies were disposed of, but I do have to explore the alternate theories that they actually did take off on their own. 
The fact that the Pattersons left everything behind would seem to go against the theory of a voluntary disappearance, but let's not forget that one of the proposed theories is that they were spies who had to take off in a big hurry. Under normal circumstances, that theory would sound way too over the top, but since it was pushed forward by one of the law enforcement officers on the case, El Paso County Sheriff Leo Samaniego, I have to address it. Obviously, this theory sounds like a Cold War era Red Scare paranoia, but what's crazy is that Samaniego presented it in 2005, not 1957. It seems like Samaniego is basing this idea around the fact that Pat liked to go around El Paso taking photographs of everything, including military installations, but given that the guy's field was photography, I'm not sure how unusual that really is. I mean, just because the guy can take photos does not necessarily mean he could provide anything useful to foreign spies. The Patterson's disappearance was only a few years removed from the saga of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, an American couple who were accused of being spies who provided top-secret information to the Soviet Union before they were convicted of conspiracy to commit espionage and executed. But the key difference is that Julius Rosenberg worked a job which gave him access to top-secret information. William Patterson's employment history included touring around the country as a carnival barker and selling black market nylon stockings from Mexico before he opened up a photography supply business. He doesn't exactly fit the profile as being a prime candidate to be recruited as a spy for the Soviets. Considering that there was nothing in the original files to suggest that the Pattersons were being investigated for espionage, I'd say that Sheriff Samaniego's theory is a bit too larger than life for my liking. But could the Pattersons have had other reasons for taking off? Well, the biggest reason that many of their friends did not believe that was because Margaret left behind her beloved cat, Tommy, and never even attempted to check him into an animal hospital. This seemed to go against the idea of Margaret disappearing voluntarily, but as devoted as she may have been to Tommy, would Pat have had any qualms about leaving him behind? So this brings up an alternate possibility. Could Pat have gone on the run alone because he murdered his wife? Well, the main reason this theory has gained a bit of traction is because of the account from their neighbor, Jerry Cash, who claimed she visited the Patterson residence on the evening of March the 5th to leave them some Girl Scout cookies, but noticed that Pat seemed unhappy she was there while Margaret looked scared. If Cash's account is accurate, then this would technically make her the last person to have seen the Pattersons alive. Of course, you will not find Cash's story in the original newspaper coverage of this case, as it was not reported on for several decades, but Cash maintained that she attempted to share this story with the authorities at the time, and they would not listen. While she did not know the Pattersons well, she always described Pat as quote-unquote mean and unfriendly, and the atmosphere at the house seemed to give Cash the uneasy impression that Pat may have done something to Margaret shortly after she left. Well, it's true that Pat was not exactly the ideal husband, as he had a history of cheating on Margaret, and it sounds like this caused her to develop a drinking problem to deal with the situation. And at the time, Pat was conducting an affair with Estefano Arroyo Marfin, who was over 30 years younger than him. Now, if Pat did kill his wife and go on the run, it would actually fit some of the pieces of the puzzle. If Kirkland was telling the truth about Pat's 3 a.m. phone call to his motel room, Pat's story about taking Margaret away to help her recover from a drinking binge could have been an excuse to cover up the fact that he murdered her. And this would also mean that the telegram Pat sent to Herbert Roth several days later was legitimate because he attempted to buy time and figure out what to do next. Also, Estefano would later claim that Pat sent her a letter in which he wrote, quote, When they come for me, I'll have to go in a hurry. While Estefano recanted the story, if she was telling the truth, then Pat may have meant he would have to leave in a hurry if the police came after him because they discovered he killed his wife. And if Pat was still alive in May of 1958, then he may have actually sent the signed letter to his lawyer with the instructions of how to dispose of his property and business. But on the other hand, if Pat was hiding out because he committed murder, why would he bother sending a letter over one year later? By that point, a lot of people were beginning to suspect he was dead, so there was no real reason to let everyone know he was still alive and give the authorities more incentive to keep searching for him. While the telegraph, the letter, and the phone call to Kirkland do provide possible evidence of Pat still being alive after March the 5th, 1957, there is no evidence of Margaret living past that date other than some possible eyewitness sightings which may have been mistaken. All that being said, there are still a ton of holes in the theory that Pat killed her. For starters, we have Nicholas Alvarez's account that another man besides Pat dropped off his Cadillac at the Ward Motor Clinic. We also have Ronaldo Nangari's story about an associate of Pat's hiring him to clean up the house and this person putting bloody sheets inside their trunk. Why would someone else be doing this if Pat was the one who committed murder? And most importantly, Pat's bank accounts were never touched after he went missing, so what exactly was he using to live on while he was in hiding? The account from Jerry Cash is odd, but there are any number of reasons why the Pattersons could have been acting that way while she was there. Perhaps at that time, they both felt their lives were in danger from someone else. I definitely think that both Pat and Margaret were murdered by an outside party, but I'd really like to know how these events would have played out. Remember, Cecil Ward had originally been planning to visit the residence that night, but backed out at the last minute because of a medical issue. I see no reason to suspect that Ward was personally involved in what happened, because unlike many of the other characters in this case, he had nothing to gain from the Patterson's disappearance, and he was the first person to officially report them missing 
albeit five months after the fact. But would things have played out differently if Ward had shown up that night? If Kirkland was involved and lied about visiting the residence, did he decide to kill the Pattersons once he realized Ward would not be there? Was this premeditated murder, or did a violent confrontation spiral out of control? Did Kirkland always have his sights on taking over Pat's business, or was this done out of necessity to cover up what he did? While there are a number of suspicious things about Kirkland, this case is so convoluted that I cannot say with 100% certainty that he was responsible. If he was, Kirkland just seemed to completely drop off the radar sometime during the 1960s, so it's unclear what happened to him, or if he's even still alive today. Whatever the case, I think it's likely that foul play took place inside the Patterson residence, and maybe the remains are still on the property or somewhere in the surrounding area. I don't know if I would necessarily say that the couple's restless spirits are haunting the place, but it's only added to the mysterious legend surrounding this unsolved case. So by chance, if you happen to have any information about the disappearances of William and Margaret Patterson, please contact the appropriate authorities. But if you just have your own thoughts about what happened, feel free to leave me a comment or send me an email to robin.warder at icloud.com. That's robin.warder at icloud.com. Now the reminder that The Trail Went Cold is on Patreon, so please visit patreon.com slash thetrailwentcold to learn how you can support our podcast and become eligible for some pretty neat rewards. We produced a bunch of exclusive bonus episodes for our patrons in tiers 2 and 3, and this past month, I released an episode about the 1982 disappearance of Sherry Eyerly, which was featured on a rather infamous segment of Unsolved Mysteries, where a psychic pointed the finger at a potential suspect who may have been completely innocent. And for our patrons in tier 3, I've also recorded another new audio commentary track, which can be played over a classic episode of Unsolved Mysteries. So to learn more information, feel free to visit our Patreon page. I'd also like to give a shout out to this week's newest Patreon supporter, Laura M., so thank you very much! And before we bring this episode to a close, I'd like to play a promo for another true crime podcast, Unjust and Unsolved. My name is Maggie Freeling. I'm an investigative journalist, and I'm excited to tell you about my new podcast from the Obsessed Network called Unjust and Unsolved. Each episode tells the story of a person who I believe has been wrongfully incarcerated. The Innocence Project gives a conservative estimate that there are over 20,000 innocent people locked away in U.S. prisons. When I learned this, I sent letters to those whose stories haunted me. I heard back from almost everyone. They all wanted to be heard. And so on Unjust and Unsolved, I'm doing just that. I speak with those people, their loved ones, advocates, and lawyers, diving deep into the crimes they were convicted of and presenting the evidence that points away from them. And if it wasn't them, then who was it? Help me search for an answer. You can find Unjust and Unsolved and all Obsessed Network podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. In addition... I need to mention that this coming Saturday, October the 24th, at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, we are going to be holding another one of our live Watch Together marathons in which we view classic segments of Unsolved Mysteries. Given what month this is, we are going to be having a special Halloween-themed live watch containing some of the more memorable paranormal segments from Unsolved Mysteries, and you can chat with myself and your fellow listeners. You can find out more information, as well as the link to our screening room, on our Facebook and Twitter pages and in the show notes for this episode. Once again, we will be holding it this coming Saturday, October the 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and I hope to see some of you there. I also just wanted to give another shout out to my supporters at the Unsolved Mysteries message board at the Sitcoms Online Forum and the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit. I need to provide a big thanks to McGill Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me, and Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. And of course, as you probably heard, we've been playing his special Halloween-themed version of the Trail Went Cold theme this month. If you haven't already, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. So have yourself a good week and join us next Wednesday as we present our final Halloween-themed episode of The Trail Went Cold. Thank <laughs> you.